Uh, good morning, everyone. It's so good to be able to open the Bible with you. I uh, thought we'd start by telling you about one of the longest marriages in uh, American history. I'm not sure about in the whole world, but this one's a pretty long one. Uh, let me introduce you to Ralph and Dorothy. Um, Ralph and Dorothy Cola are from Palm Springs, California. Um, actually, it's a place where people live long uh, in the desert because it's very dry. You don't get quite as sick. Um, they were married in 1935, and uh, she was 16, he was 17. Um, apparently, the first judge they went to said, no, you're too young to get married. The second judge uh, gave them uh, permission to get married only if they had their parents' uh, blessing, which they did. Um, although he said, I don't think this is going to last very long. Um, however, they got married in uh, 1935, and they were married for 86 years and a few days. Um, in an interview in 2022, Ralph um, who was 104 years old at the time, uh, he said this uh, about the secret to a long marriage. He said, the secret to a long marriage is togetherness. Um, and uh, Ralph credited their longevity in life and marriage due to healthy habits. Uh, neither of them had ever drunk alcohol or smoked cigarettes. Uh, they were ballroom dancing champions. And uh, there's a fa it's actually a fabulous photo of them. Like, you know, she's sort of leaning back. And, um, and then they also enjoyed duck hunting, which is in their picture there. And they made that duck hunting into a career. They taught duck hunting. So there you go. Um, sadly, Ralph passed away um, in January 2022. He was 104 years old. And it was just three weeks after his bride passed away. Um, and uh, his kids said that he died of a broken heart. Uh, isn't that sad, but kind of wonderful? Uh, uh, if you're anything like me, we love a good love story. There's something very wholesome about a love story that lasts a lifetime. And uh, our Bible passage today is all about a love story that lasted a lifetime, this love story between Abraham and Sarah. So I want to reflect on that today and the lessons that we learn uh, from them. But first, why don't we pray and ask God to teach us as we read from the Bible. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for the Bible and for your words to us. Will you teach us about life and love and faith as we hear from you today? And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, well, we have been following the story of Abraham and the promises of God in our sermon series, All Term. Uh, and even though this is a very old part of the Bible, uh, we've seen that it still has much to teach us, uh, even thousands of years later. Uh, it's a story that teaches us how God's Old Testament people came to live in the land that we now call Israel. Uh, it's a story of how God makes promises to us, promises that he always keeps, even when it seems hard at the time. Uh, and so that's where uh, today's story starts in Genesis 23. We've been journeying with Abraham for over 60 years. Uh, remember, he was 75 years old when God called him out of the land of his father and made three promises to him. What were the three promises? Land, nation, and blessing. You guys are so good. Uh, God promised Abraham that he would bring him into a land, that country that would belong to his offspring. And, and then uh, that was tied to the second promise. God promised to make Abraham into a great nation. That is, his descendants would be as numerous as the sand on the seashore or the stars in the sky. By the way, that's why we have all the stars on the picture. Did you work that out before? Um, uh, we designed it that way. Lastly, God promised to bless Abraham and to uh, use his family to bring blessing to the whole world. Uh, those are the promises that God made to Abraham when he was 75 years old. His wife was 65. And uh, one of the things we've learned through this series is that God's promises don't always materialize overnight. Uh, remember, Abraham and Sarah waited 25 years before their son Isaac was finally born. Abraham was 90, 100 years old then, and Sarah was 90. Neither of them had ever expected to have that joy of um, children at such an advanced age. Uh, and in fact, they both laughed at the idea, and uh, so much so they called their son Laughter. That's what Isaac's name means. Not that their marriage had always been filled with laughter, Many years have been filled with the grief of childlessness and uh, their attempts to build a family through one of Sarah's uh, maidservants had brought unhappiness and heartache to the household and the marriage had been in jeopardy not once but twice as Abraham allowed Sarah to be taken as a wife by foreign kings um, and, uh, and I think after the story from last week, um, there definitely would have been, would have been words spoken by Sarah um, when she found out that Abraham almost sacrificed Isaac. <laughs> that would have been quite a conversation. But every relationship has its ups and downs, especially when it lasts more than 60 years. And in fact, it's likely that Abraham and Sarah had been married closer to 100 years if they married when she was young. 
Um, yet despite those difficulties, Sarah, had uh, she'd been Abraham's soulmate through all of those years of following God's purposes. And when you think about it, She'd chosen to go with Abraham as he left his family back in Ur, and no doubt she left all of her family there too. As she'd made the journey with Abraham to Canaan and and then to Egypt in the famine, and she'd stayed with him in all the pinnacle moments of his life, Um, Sarah was Abraham's princess, as her name means in their language. So after so many years together, Genesis 23 opens with the tragic news of Sarah's death. Sarah lived to be 127 years old and she died at Kiriath Arba, that is Hebron, in the land of Canaan. And Abraham went to mourn for Sarah and to weep over her. So Abraham mourns and he weeps for Sarah. And I know there are some people in this room who knows exactly what that feels like to lose your soulmate. Um, I don't pretend to imagine what it must be like, but in those two verses, we just get a glimpse into Abraham's pain. He goes to mourn for Sarah, and he weeps over her. Um, Bible commentator Kent Hughes um, says, this is a very brief description of grief for a very long marriage. Isn't that true? Just one verse, he mourned and he wept. How do you make sense of a loss like this? How do you process the death of a loved one? Well, I want to take you to some ancient wisdom uh, from the book of Ecclesiastes to help us think about death, perhaps in a way that we wouldn't normally think about it. And I'm hoping this might be a preview of a series that we want to do next year from Ecclesiastes. It's uh, Ecclesiastes, the book of wisdom, written by perhaps the wisest man ever, Solomon, the son of David, uh, the great king. Ecclesiastes means teacher. And so in Ecclesiastes 7, the teacher teaches us this about death. He says, it's better to go to a house of mourning than to go to a house of feasting, for death is the destiny of everyone. And the living should take this to heart. See, the teacher turns upside down what most of us would think about death. If we had to choose between a party and a funeral, well, of course, we would choose the party. We'd prefer to go to a feast with our family or have a memorable holiday or or a weekend away with your best friends or a meal at a fantastic restaurant. Those are the life events that most of us look back on and look back on with um, Uh, fondness, those are the events that punctuate a happy life. But the teacher teaches us that we learn more from a funeral than we do from a party. See, when we go to the house of mourning, it reminds us that the eternal matters. Uh, There is more to this life than these 80 or 90 years. Uh, It says it right there, death is the destiny of everyone and the living should take this to heart. So the death of a loved one, it reminds us that this world is not all there is. This life is not all there is. Eternity awaits. And uh, and this is not a sad thing. It's actually a great blessing. This blessing that God promised to Abraham, it awaits us in the land that God promised. It's not a land that can be invaded or or devastated by fire and flood. Uh, It's an everlasting city where God himself dwells amongst us. It's a place of happiness. Never again the interruption of death or the loss of a loved one. That mourning and that weeping will be no more. Because this old world has passed away. And that's what the death of a loved one should remind us of, the teacher teaches. And all the wonderful experiences that we cherish in this lifetime, all the wonderful memories you have, do you know what? They're actually only a shadow of what's to come. Uh, Because it's almost like our real life hasn't even begun yet. Uh, When the famous evangelist Billy Graham uh, spoke about his death, I know I've shared this before, but when he spoke about this, uh, his death, this is what he said. He said, someday you'll read or hear that Billy Graham is dead. Don't believe a word of it. I shall be more alive than I am now. I will have just changed my address. I will have gone into the presence of God. I shall be more alive than I am now. Isn't that a great way to think about eternity? Um, Jesus promises that he came to give us life and life to the full. And our mortal death is the beginning of that life that never ends. There's a tiny catch, of course, um, that that eternal life is only for those who align themselves with Jesus in this lifetime. Because the other reality of death is that one day we will stand before the throne of God and we'll have to give an account for our life and what we did with it. And that might sound intimidating, but I don't think it should be. See, what I love about the death of Sarah is the way that she's remembered in the New Testament. Because she's not remembered for her mistakes. 
And we've read about some of them over the last six or eight weeks. She's not remembered for her mistakes. She's remembered for her faith. Uh, In 1 Peter chapter 3, um, Sarah is commended for trusting God as she followed Abraham through all of the ups and downs in their lifelong journey together. And then in Hebrews 11, it says this, uh, by faith, even Sarah, who was past childbearing age, was enabled to bear children because she considered him faithful who'd made the promise. Uh, Sarah's commended for trusting God uh, that God would give her a child, just like he promised he would. Sarah's remembered for her faith. And so the death of Sarah reminds us that we are more than the sum total of our mistakes and our sins by faith in Christ. God looks back at our lives and he credits our faith as righteousness, just like he did with Abraham. Um, Our mistakes are forgiven, our sins are forgiven and they're put behind us when we give them to Jesus on the cross. And if you look through Hebrews 11, um, this long list of the heroes of the Bible who were commended for their faith, you realize that none of them were perfect. None of them were perfect. None of them lived a mistake-free life. None of them lived a sin-free life. They were all like you and me. But you know what? God remembers their faith, not their mistakes. Death is a terrible part of life, this side of heaven, um, and the grief is real. But Jesus takes the sting out of death by showing us that there is life beyond the grave. And Jesus takes the sting out of death by showing us that we are more than the sum total of our mistakes. God will remember our faith on the day that we stand before him. And all of that means that we can appreciate death for what it teaches us. A commentator, David Gibson, writes in his little commentary, he says, death dons a preacher's robe to teach us that life is finite and we must use it well. So you and I are finite, that is, we will finish one day, Uh, we will end, our life will be finished, Uh, one day this life will be over, and the question is, how are you using your life? Well, the second part of the passage today, we might come back to that picture, second part of the passage for today is the account of Abraham buying a burial plot for his wife. Uh, It feels really funny, I think, a bit strange that the negotiations for a piece of land take up almost the entire chapter, um, when so little is said about the death of Sarah. Um, What is so important about this field that it warrants this level of attention? And our first clue, I think, is there in verse 3 and 4. Then Abraham rose from beside his dead wife, and he spoke to the Hittites. He said, I'm a foreigner and a stranger among you. Sell me some property for a burial site here, so I can bury my dead. Uh, Do you see the problem there? Uh, Abraham is a foreigner and a stranger. Even though he's been living in the land for 60 years, uh, by the way, uh, what land is this? This is a promised land, the the land that God had sworn to give him uh, and to his offspring. But for now, and for the last 60 years, Abraham has still been a foreigner and a stranger. He's probably spent those 60 years grazing his flocks and moving between watering holes and living in tents just like his ancestors did who lived back out in in the far east. Perhaps this is the first time a family member has died uh, or a significant family member, which is amazing in itself. Over the course of some 60 years, they'd never had to encounter this problem. Where do I bury my dead? But now Abraham's first wife, is uh, she lies dead and he wants to give her a permanent resting place. As a foreigner, however, he has no land. And so Abraham has to negotiate the purchase of a property. And um, what we see in the middle verses of this chapter is this very formal process where the buyer and seller goes back and forth in in polite tones. And uh, underneath the formality, though, they are negotiating the sale of a property. And nobody gives away prime real estate for nothing. Uh, So follow along with me from verse 4. I'm going to paraphrase a little bit. Abraham says, I'm a foreigner and a stranger among you. Sell me some property for a burial site so I can bury my dead. And then the Hittites reply to him in verse 6. Sir, listen to us. You are a mighty prince among us. Bury your dead in the choicest of our tombs. None of us will refuse you his tomb for burying his dead, or burying your dead. Um, Abraham bows down before them. And by the way, this is the only time that Abraham ever bows down before anybody. Uh, But it's clearly part of the formalities, just as uh, it was part of the formality for the Hittites to offer Abraham his choice of tombs. Um, I don't think they're quite as serious about all that. I think this is still a business deal. Um, This is still a business deal. Um, So the outward demeanor doesn't always match the inner attitude. 
But Abraham continues negotiating, wants an introduction to Ephron. Uh, verse 9 tells us Ephron has a cave, the end of one of his fields. Abraham offers to buy the cave for full price. And now Ephron, who owns the field, likes this game. He says, no, 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 my Lord. Listen to me, I give you the field. I give you the field and the cave that's in it. I give it to you in the presence of my people. Bury your dead. Actually, three times Abraham, uh, Ephron says he will give the property to Abraham, not just the cave, but also the field. Um, see how the property deal just got bigger? <laughs> not just cave, have a field as well. Um, and he says it in front of everybody. This is the way to make yourself sound very generous. Tell everybody what you've given uh, or what you're prepared to give. Make yourself sound magnanimous in the presence of your friends. Well, Abraham bows again and he offers to pay not just for the cave, but the field as well. And Ephron answers, well, listen to me, my Lord. Um, the land is worth 400 shekels um, uh, of silver. But what is that between me and you? Bury your dead. Um, <laughs> it turns out 400 shekels is a lot for a field and a cave. But uh, Abraham's in no position to haggle, uh, not without losing face. Uh, and I think there's some other reasons too. I don't think he wants anybody but to say, we gave this to you. He wants to know that it is done properly. He weighs out this two and a half kilos of silver. That's what 400 shekels was. Uh, according to the weight current among the merchants, um, that is, he's done everything by the book. Um, the land now belongs to Abraham. And because he did the deal in front of the Hittites, nobody can dispute the transaction. Nobody can say, oh, you stole the field or you didn't pay the full price. Or There's no way. And twice we're told that Abraham was deeded, uh, the land was deeded to Abraham. Now, why such a big deal over a field? Well, after 60 years wandering through the land that God had promised to Abraham, until this moment, none of it had belonged to him. Not a piece. Uh, now, I don't know how it felt to Abraham paying for the land uh, that God had said would be his after all. You know, God did say that he would give the land to Abraham, uh, not that he would have to pay for it. Uh, but I don't think that's the important part of this passage or the point. Um, it's not like when Abraham tried to hurry up God's promise of a child by sleeping with his wife's servant. No, rather, I think this is a moment of great faith by Abraham. It's this moment where he puts his trust in God's promises, that, that one day his offspring would own every part of the land that he'd been living in for so long as a stranger. A stranger who had to pay double for a plot of land to bury his wife, a stranger who they called a prince, while taking uh, his money as a sucker, uh, a stranger who probably had to pay to water his flocks and herds, a stranger and a foreigner, and never somebody who belonged. Until this moment when he buries his wife in that cave, trusting that one day he too would be buried there, him and his offspring. Uh, and that faith was rewarded. As we read the rest of the Old Testament, the cave of Machpelah became the burial plot for um, all of Abraham's family. Um, Abraham himself was buried there. Uh, his later his son Isaac, his grandson Jacob. And this cave was so important that even Joseph, who died and was buried in Egypt, he was carried up 430 years later um, by Moses, who gave his bones to Joshua, who eventually repatriated them into the promised land. You see, Abraham wasn't a sucker. Abraham was a believer. He believed that God would do what he said he would do. He believed that God would give this land to his sons and their sons. And so that 400 shekels of silver, it was actually a very small price to pay for the land in the scheme of things. Um, Abraham's modest investment earned him this incalculable return as the word of God became reality. And so one of the questions the passage asks us is, uh, what are we investing in, in this lifetime? See, if God has promised this, this heavenly future where we're brought into his family, where we're given a home, where we experience the blessing of his presence, shouldn't that be the thing that we're investing in? Um, shouldn't we be investing in God's kingdom? Shouldn't it drive our priorities and our investment goals? Shouldn't the reality of the future of heaven sh uh, help us to shape our investments today? Um, I love that you're here this morning. Uh, you're here because you're investing in God's kingdom. Uh, you're here worshiping God and thanking Jesus for the gift that we have uh, of, of forgiveness and the gift that is gonna come to us when we uh, come to heaven with him in the future. Uh, and every time we stop to read our Bible or pray, we're investing in God's kingdom. 
Uh, many of you are investing in God's kingdom financially as well, uh, enabling missionaries and ministers like myself to share the hope of Jesus so that more and more people can uh, uh, share in that eternal life that we're looking forward to. Um, but that all takes money, doesn't it? You know, it takes money to build churches. As Rod said, you know, we're here partly because of the bequests of somebody who gave five acres and there are some other buildings people have given in the past and it continues to take money to build churches and to pay the utilities and to staff a kids program and to put on events and outreach. But it's all an investment in God's kingdom because we believe that God's kingdom is real and we trust that one day this earthly kingdom will be no more and that God's kingdom will be all that there is. And on that day, our faith will be made sight. We'll see it finally for what it was. We'll finally see what our investment was going towards. And I'm sure you're not going to regret it. So, uh, brothers and sisters, what are you investing in? Uh, Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that in Christ, uh, we are promised the forgiveness of our sins and the hope of eternal life with you in heaven. Uh, in a place where there's no more mourning and crying and pain. Father, we know that this side of heaven, uh, we experience all of those things all too keenly. So I pray for anybody today who is in mourning, uh, suffering from the loss of a loved one. Father, would you, by your Holy Spirit, uh, bring comfort and start to heal those hurts? And Father, by your Spirit, would you remind us that death has lost its sting uh, sting when we know your son Jesus uh, because you promised us eternal life with him. And so, Father, we ask that you would give us such a vision of your kingdom, uh, your eternal kingdom with your son and around your throne, uh, that we would want to give our lives to it, um, our everything, our heart, soul, mind, strength, uh, our our intellect, our mind, uh, our money. Father, help us to invest in your kingdom. And we pray, Father, by your spirit that many more people would come to know this hope that we have in Jesus Christ. Uh, Here in Robertson, in Barrowang, around the highlands and all across Australia and the world. And we pray that Jesus would be honoured through what we do with our lives. Amen. We're going to stand and sing. Uh, We're going to remind ourselves of... um,